Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and we'd like to welcome you back to uh, episode two of our brand new video series that we have uh, titled The Qibla Controversy. And specifically, we want to call it uh, King versus Gibson. And you'll know why in a little bit. Last time, uh, we gave you an introductory video about the background behind this Qibla issue and uh, the controversy behind it the findings by Dan Gibson and also the attempt to refute it academically by Dr. David King. Today with me back here in studio is Dr. J. Smith to continue basically with our uh, attempt to unpack uh, this controversy for you and begin to give you uh, the different views presented by both parties. Uh, Jay. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back again. And remember, in the last episode, we left just with this controversy coming to the fore. And the reason why is Dr. David King is the ruled authority on the Qibla. Uh, and he's in retirement now. So he's at the end of his life. Uh, I shouldn't say life, but certainly his career. And uh, his career to that time had pretty much uh, rested on a presupposition uh, which he thought was pretty sound and pretty tight. Uh, and suddenly this upstart from Canada, <clears throat> who is an amateur, comes up with an entirely new theory to make sense of all of these misdirected Qiblas that were in, in every direction. Uh, s uh, and we're going to uh, look at what King was saying. Now, you can understand. Put yourself in King's place. You can understand why he's upset. I'd be upset. You'd be upset. If everything you've worked towards and you've got all the accolades and you're the one, you're the authority and you have a doctorate and you studied under people like Kennedy and Shaw, the, Shaw these the guys are the best known in, the, in, that, in their world. You can see why you're the one that should be getting all the accolades. You're the one that should everybody should be studying from. You, in fact, if anything, Gibson should have come under him and studied Mm -hmm. under him. Right. Why didn't Gibson come and do his work under him? And that comes up in this controversy. What controversy? Well, this is it right here. So he had to write a response, and so he wrote up this response. It's 52 pages long, and uh, you can get it. It's up online. Just pull it down, and you'll see uh, King has really gone through to the nail trying to confront Gibson. Because this is a shock to everything that he believes. This is a shock to everything that he's done. This is a shock to him. Can That's you understand right. why Gibson is a thorn in his flesh. And here's what I want to say about this. For anyone to take the time to write a 50 plus page, that tells me the issue is serious enough for Dr. King to take the time to respond to it, which we're, we're thankful for. In other words, you can call Dan Gibson amateur, but he's an amateur that we have already disclosed that did practical visitations of these sites and did his analysis based on actual data, not theoretically. Okay. Is that correct? And that, you're getting to the nub of the problem right there. Uh, this paper, look at, let I me mean, just look at the title. It says, The Petra Fallacy, Early Moss do face the sacred Kaaba in Mecca, but Dan Gibson doesn't know how. Even the title is a thumbs up, thumb your nose at Dan Gibson. Well, I would add something here. Uh, maybe it did say the subtitle, Early Mosque Do Face the Sacred Kaaba, but the Quran never said that. <laughs> okay, but that, it's, it, it, yeah. that is true, and we're going to get into that. But the Early Mosque don't face any ka the Kaaba. Right. Yeah. They don't face any, and they certainly don't face Mecca. Right. And so that is the problem. What are you going to do with this difficulty? And, you know, uh, King certainly talked about it. He has many students under him who have heard about this problem. And if you go down, I'm just going to get to the right page here. He then really confronts Dan uh, when, his, uh, when he introduces Dan. Enter Dan Gibson with his early Qibla, Islamic Qiblas. Hey, a Canadian amateur. He certainly is very creative. This contradicts everything we know about early Islam. In fact, he just doesn't get it. This is referring to Dan Gibson. If Gil Gibson is ill-informed, he appears to be quite clueless. He apparently just doesn't know. He is singularly uninformed. These are the kind of things you see over and over and over again wow. on this paper. Now, what does that tell you right there? Well, I mean, first of all, someone who is taking things personal. Number two, I, I caught something you said uh, doesn't know anything about what we know concerning early Islam. Here's my question. 
what sources of early Islam is he basing it on? No, you're going to find out that Gibson knows even more than he does. Yeah. Gibson has 10,000 books in his library from early Islam. What does King have and where did King go? And this is why we need to start this whole series looking at the presupposition of both these men. So let's look at the next slide and let's take a look at this and put it up on screen. This is now whenever you see something blue like this or blue green, this is from Gibson's own videos and you, you need to go up on his videos. Vid, Gibson has responded. Uh, he has responded to King and but look at the way uh, Gibson responds and look at the way King responds. Whenever Gibson responds, he responds like we are right now, just talking back and forth. He does not raise his voice. He never names calls. He's never uh, used vitriol in any of his responses. He's very humble. He comes across as a very humble Christian, like he should do. And he's very clear that, uh, that though Gibson has his viewpoints, he doesn't agree with those viewpoints. And he has all the right to have those viewpoints. You mean King, you know. Uh, Sorry, did I say Gibson? Yes, so Gibson is saying while King has these viewpoints, Thank you. he's fine. Yeah. King has those viewpoints. Right. Gibson uh, doesn't have any problem with those viewpoints. He just disagrees with them. Uh, just like you just dis disagreed with me. And rightly so, because I said the wrong name. <laughs> so these are, these are things that this is how Gibson works. And I think ballyhoo for him, good for him. God bless him. Yeah, that's the kind of attitude we should have. And this is what we call peer review. This is what every scholar, every academic, every researcher needs to be reviewed. Absolutely, Jay. You went through it in your dissertation. I'm going to be going through it, you know, on a uh, annual basis, actually, uh, peer review. You attend some of those sometimes. We need to hold each other accountable. Nothing wrong with that. What's interesting is whenever I get reviewed, I get a lot. It's usually by Muslims. And when the Muslims review me, I get exactly what David King has just done. I'm so used to this that it doesn't even bother me. It's obviously that Gibson's not used to this kind of response. And in his, uh, in his videos, and there are six of them that are up there, I would encourage every you to go and look at those six videos. Uh, they have the same greenish-blue tint to them so you know which ones to go to and they are all about he and King and he says so very clearly that this is a response to this paper uh, to this paper that is uh, came, has been out for about a year now 52 pages and he goes right through point by point by point by point and responds to each point that's what you're supposed to do not sit there and throw out all this vitriol and I get all upset and emotional about it in fact as I was reading it I was scratching my head said is, is this even worthwhile because it's obvious to me that this man is very emotional. It's obvious to me that in his emotion, he is mostly attacking Dan's character rather than attacking the, really attacking the problem. And I want to look at his presupposition. Let's put up that slide again, because this is the presupposition he comes from. And this is, I think, at the root of the problem of everything we're going to be talking about. This, this is the timeline that David King puts up. And his timeline starts with four different eras in Islam. Well, one is pre-Islam, and that's the one on the left, pre-Islam, uh, which uh, goes to around 540s. Uh, then he starts with early Islam, starting with 550. It's interesting that he uses that date, because Muhammad was only born in 570. That's, Nonetheless. that's very true. I mean, uh, right there, there's a problem just with the dating if you want to follow the tradition. If you believe that Islam existed before Muhammad, then maybe 550, then why don't you write, go right back to Adam and Eve? But that's right. I don't think King is taking that premise. I think he would start with Muhammad himself. But even Muhammad wasn't a Muslim in 570. He really only became a Muslim in 610 when he started receiving his Correct. revelations. So I would have put 610 to 799. But that's something that King doesn't really explain. He just puts those down. I would love to know his explanation why he chose those dates. And he goes up to the eight, eight, uh, to 800s. And then he starts with medieval Islam. 800 to 1300, and then he talks about modern Islam from 1300 up until the present. Now, I have no difficulty with medieval and modern. I think those are probably correct. I will use those dates. We've already queried that for former dates, but that's not, we're not here to really query that. Let's just go with that medieval Islam, the third one. That is where everything comes together for him. So his whole premise, his whole supposition is, since these earlier uh, Muslims who start to appear when Muhammad appears and starts getting this revelation, let's say, say from 610 on, these are the earlier Muslims, but the Qiblas would have only been created 
according to what we now know from chapter 2, verse 149 and 150, according to what Islam tells us, that this Qibla, that this redirection down to the Masjid al-Haram, not Mecca, but this Masjid al-Haram, would have been when, Mah when Mah Muhammad would have moved to Medina. He would have moved to Medina in 6... 22, That's and he correct. started having this conflict with the Jews in 624 when the Jews rejected him. Then he gets this new revelation from God that they're now, that the, okay, this, this is what this, uh, the standard classical account says, that he then gets this new revelation from God in chapter 2, verse 149 and 150, that it's to be redirected to the Masjid al-Haram. So according to Islamic tradition, that means from Jerusalem to Mecca. Well, we don't know it's Mecca at all. We just know it's Masjid. It must be re redirected to the Masjid. And that most scholars believe would have happened around 624. Could be between 622 and 624. Let's go with 624, just for rather than saying 622, 624, let's just say 624, because it would happen at the end of this relationship with the Jews. Correct. All right, 624, So, which means Every mosque built after 624 should be facing this Masjid al-Haram. That's, that's the assumption based on this tradition. Now, when we read it earlier, we looked at it, and in my Quran, it says next to Masjid al-Haram, in parentheses, Mecca. Yeah, because there is no mention of Mecca in the verse. And the, to say the and Masjid al-Haram, that doesn't necessarily mean Mecca. There is basically more than one called the Masjid al-Haram. For instance, the one in Medina. For instance, the Dome of the Rock one in Jerusalem is called this way. So, so it, I would argue and would say, well, maybe this was pointing to the one in Jerusalem, the Masjid al-Haram that was there, or towards the one in Medina, since Muhammad received his revelation when he was in Medina, and his mosque was basically Turn there. Turn your face the direction of, singular, we brought that up in the last episode, right. one direction, Masjid al-Haram. What does it mean? And this is where Dan Gibson wants to come in. But see, according to according to King, this Masjid al-Haram had to be Mecca. It had to be Mecca. He doesn't even come into the understanding that there was no reference to Mecca that early. He, does, he hasn't looked at Patricia Corona's material, who, she's the one that has written a whole book on this in 1987, Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. Read that book, King, read that book. There is no reference to a place called Mecca until 741. Right, so he's That's relying on Islamic century. sources, basically. So he is not even aware of this problem with Mecca. Either that or he just doesn't want to bring it up. But if you're not going to look at the early, the latest material, the, early, the latest uh, evidence that's coming out, and if you're not even knowing that the fact that there is no Mecca, we can't find any reference of Mecca anywhere at any time in any inscription in any language. Dr. Patricia Corona, who is the world authority on this, she is the one that reads and writes 15 languages. She got her degree. She is a doctorate from Cambridge, uh, from, from School of Oriental and African Studies there in London, was head of department at Cambridge University, wrote this book while she was at Cambridge, had a death threat from the Muslims for writing this book along with Hagarism and had to move I'm sorry, this was at Oxford University. I'm getting my universities wrong now. See, it's a good thing that you're here to correct me. Thank you for correcting me again. Started there at, at Cambridge University and wrote the book, got her death threat there, moved did I say it again? Started his degree in Oxford University, yes. wrote a book in Oxford University in 1987, had to then move to Cambridge University, and that's where I met her, that's where we became uh, friends, and that's where she actually helped me with my very first debate in 1990. That's right. 1990, I want to say 1994. 1995 was my first debate on her material, on 10 different problems, historical problems, of which Mecca was one of them. And you know, I mean, her work, while was being criticized, right now, today, you can go back to it and say that was brilliant. It was a pioneering research because today you can make the argument that she has a solid foundation for doubting that Mecca is a city that existed prior to discovering the name on any of the ancient maps. If this is the major city for all trade north, east, south, west, according to the trade Oh, I would theory, say the prominence of Mecca. But yeah, Montgomery yeah. Watt brought this up in the That's early right. 1900s yeah. that this is how he came up with his trade route theory himself. She debunked that in just one book in 1987. If this is where Abraham lived, according to Surah, Surah 21, if he was there going into the Kaaba, according to Surah 21. How come the Jews didn't go there? Remember, the <laughs> Jews settled north of Mecca. They would have settled there. That's the place of Abraham, right? 
Better than that, isn't this where Adam and Eve were sent to when they were thrown out of the out That's of the right. Garden of Eden in That's chapter right. seven, verse four, uh, verse twenty four? Isn't that where they're sent to? That's According right. to the traditions, right. Eve goes to Mecca and Adam goes to Carolyn, and then he strides up from Carolyn, and moves and over they to meet Mecca. at Arafat, Mount Arafat. So, yes. is this not the oldest city in the history of mankind? Exactly. Would it not be certainly a city that existed in 1900 BC if Abraham were there? And if it was a center of trade, north, south, east, and west, if this is where Muhammad was born, grew up, shouldn't someone have known about it? Without Would it doubt. be on any maps? Without a doubt. Not one map has it on it. Not one map until the 900s. That is, that is, that is 300 years too late. There is nothing referred to, to it, no reference to it in any... Listen, I said this in 1995, quoting Patricia Crone, who wrote this in 1987, and to date, no Muslims have come up with any support for a city called Mecca. Oh, they come up with Bakka all the time without realizing, and you know Arabic, Bakka is not Mecca. And Bakka, there is the Bakka Valley, actually, north of Israel. In fact, we know of three Bekkas. We That's know true. three Bekkas, the Bekka Valley that's still there in Lebanon today. Yeah. When the Bible talks about Bekka, it's talking about that. It's talking about that valley, and that's where you got the right place at the right time with the right people. You cannot say that's Mecca, because even in Arabic, it's two completely different completely different consonants, aren't they? Absolutely, and, and, and the thing is, like, I, I lived in Saudi, and I've never heard a single person from Mecca call it Bekka. Now, they will tell you it's in the Quran that way, but it's always known to them as Mecca. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see this is this is usually an argument by non-Arabs. This is a people people don't know Arabic, yeah. and it's usually coming out of the Indian subcontinent. But nonetheless, so she was the one that really hammered Mecca. Why does it kid David King didn't know this? Why is it David King did stand up a surprise and realize? Hold on a minute, if there's no Mecca till 741, 741 mid 8th century, then why is it that? Because this not explained that maybe the reason there's something why this could this be the reason why these kiblas are not in that direction? Why did he even come up with that assumption? Why did he even put that as a postulate? Absolutely, there's nothing in this paper. In fact, it's just the opposite. He said it's just the opposite, and I can't believe it because I'm sitting here as someone who's totally I, I'm not an expert in this field. I'm not. Uh, you're not an expert in this field. But when he says that they all are towards Mecca. I'm just sitting here and saying, you know, is this man really reading what he's writing? And that's what I'm saying, you know, there is a difference between uh, basically theoretical versus practical. You know, in theory, you can say anything. And you probably even can make an argument theoretically to try to prove it. But once you put the test in a practical way, as Dan Gibson did, when tested it, used satellite image and, you know, coordinates and also all kind of things, he began to pinpoint with data what was going on. Yeah, so this is his theory. If you take that medieval uh, uh, quadrant, if you take that medieval area, uh, so when you look at the medieval area, and when you look at that, that is 800 to 1300. That's his, he zeroes in 800 to 1300. And he chose that purposely because 800 to 1300 yeah, inc basically. includes al-Bazdawi. And he did his paper on al-Bazdawi. And he likes al-Bazdawi because he died in 1100. And so he wants to use al-Bazdawi. He wants to use all those scholars from that period to help him understand why these Qiblas are in different directions. Now his premise, you know, is David King's premise is actually a good one. Who are we in the 21st century as Europeans, as Americans, as even you who are now... That's his premise. His yeah. premise. Who are we in the 21st century? It doesn't matter who we are, Muslim or not, especially non-Muslim. Who are we to decide why these people had these kibbles in so many different directions? Well, as a former Muslim from Saudi and an Arab, I have every right now to examine these discoveries. Okay. And... Um, Therefore, that's a good premise. That's kind of ethnocentric for us to think that we know better. Uh, and that's what he's pretty claiming against Dan Gibson. Who are you, a Canadian? Amateur Canadian. You have no degree. In fact, he goes on and he says, you didn't even study under me. You didn't look. You didn't quote me. Why didn't you quote me? I'm the world expert on this. Why didn't you quote me? Uh, and that comes up in his paper quite regularly. Why didn't you look at, look who I studied under. You were never one of my students. In fact, according to what Dan Gibson says in one of his videos, some of his students were in his class when he was getting ready for this paper. And he was actually livid. He was so angry at Dan Gibson because he he had the audacity to suggest that he knew more than David King yeah. on this area. And to be fair, David King probably does know an awful lot more, has probably studied longer than Dan Gibson. I, but, I, but the biggest problem is their presupposition. For Dan King, but David King, I'm going to keep calling Dan, 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 David. I'm sorry here. Keep correcting me because well, I'm... Let's call King and Gibson. King That's and Gibson. Yeah. So King, 
King starts with this premise that to understand why they're all confused, you need to go to the medieval period, that 800 to 1300 period. You need to go to that period, and that will tell you, because they know best because they're closest to the event. Okay, I understand that. That's good. My big problem is, shouldn't you go to the people who are actually erecting these giblas? That's right. Shouldn't you actually go back to the period before? Shouldn't you go before 800? Shouldn't you go back to the 600s and the 700s when all these mosques were being constructed? Shouldn't you go and see what they're saying? You know, and here's the problem. Go ahead. None of them are saying anything. There is nothing said as to why these kibbas were wrong. Nothing has been said. You can't find anything written about these kibbas in the 600s or the 700s. The only place you can go to to find the, where they're going to be written is the 800s and the 900s and the 1000s. So King is starting from a very strong premise. This is all we've got, guys. Therefore, we've got to go with what we've got. But take a look and see what he's reading. And see, Dan Gibson's read all this. He admits it. Listen, they're on my shelf. I've shot them right here. I've got al Dawi here. I've got everything you've got. I've got 10,000 books here. Do you have that many? He says, I've read all, I've been spending 25 years reading this because I was as curious as you or anybody else as to why these kibbas were all completely wrong. I've read all of them. And guess what I'm finding? Yeah. They were as confused as you are. <laughs> they don't know why. They're admitting it. We don't understand why these people are uh, directing their kiblas, this these different directions. Different directions? No, not hundreds of different directions, not even 10 different directions, not even seven different directions, four different directions. And that's a good point for us to stop because uh, we would like really to do this series. It's justice by unpacking these issues, maybe one video at a time. And uh, thank you, of course, for uh, this wonderful now background behind the controversy itself, not just the introduction, but now people begin to know that in our next at least uh, series of videos, we'll begin to take apparently uh, Dr. King's argument and presuppositions and begin to analyze them as we go. Uh, what else is left so that people anticipate uh, you know, what will be covered. We're going to actually go and look at the presuppositions that the, that you could only go to the ninth, the ninth, 10th, 11th to understand what was happening in the 6th and 7th, 7th uh, and 8th, sorry. And we're going to go and show the, how wrong this supposition is. Then we're also going to go show what Dan has actually found. We're going to look at those four different uh, directions and find that they actually do make sense. They absolutely do make sense. And we're going to see why they make sense if you look at the political situation that was happening on the ground. If you look and see what was happening politically, you can see why that makes sense. But then we're also going to look and see how King tries to support what he does. And we're going to look at the seven areas, he, six or seven areas. I'm, we may just go with uh, six of them because the seventh one, he doesn't really explain. But we'll decide on that. We're going to look at these seven areas and we're going to look and be critical that we're going to do what and help Dan out in this because we really want to not only uh, have Dan try to come up with uh, responses, I think there are some even better responses than even what Dan has found, uh, Gibson has found. And so we're going to show that there's actually some great responses to what King is saying. And then we're going to look at six mosques that he looks at and try to prove his theories. And we're going to look at every one of those six mosques and we're going to disprove every one of them. So and when you say this. six mosques, we're talking about Dr. King having six mosques to prove his theory. And our job is to, to try to unpack his own presuppositions. Using so in every case, he's got exactly. the wrong he's got the wrong theory to, to understand it. Very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jay. And I hope everybody now is uh, uh, going to be wait with great anticipation uh, for these upcoming videos. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video. And we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.